means are Victor, Richard, Varun, and Edgar. Uh, as a company, our mission statement is to empower every person and every organization through our projects through being uh, the top general contractor in Denver, Colorado, and uh, all around the world, uh, the United States. Our vision is to be quality in the owner and employee's eyes and value our clients as a whole. Our company history is that we were founded in 2008. Uh, our construction sectors are commercial, residential, and high rise. One of our key goals is to have safety first. We value ourselves in being one of the safest general contractors in Colorado. Um, that was our one of the missions from our CEO, Victor Vayer. Um, On to the next slide. Uh, one of the projects that we worked on here in downtown Denver is this high rise building on 100, uh, 1144 15th Street. It, it has a height of 609, uh, 40 stories. This project was started in mid of 2015 and with a completion uh, in two years. Uh, it has a floor plan of 640,000 square foot at a cost of $300 million. Moving on to the, the moving on to the next projects is going to be our Chase Bank Center. The, pro, the budget of the project is going to be around $1 billion. The duration of the project is going to be around 30 months duration. And the seating capacity is going to, going to be around 18,000 seats. The facility is going to be open, on, open by September 2019. So for our new project, uh, we're working a single family home in Denver, Colorado. Uh, the square feet of this project is 3,275. It, it has an open courtyard, five beds, four bathrooms, and a rice living area. So we divided our work break activity in seven activities. Uh, uh, they are the we divide, they are final design, site work, foundation, framing, interior finishes, MEP, and exterior finishes. Uh, to continue with phase one, uh, we we created a code system which consisted of, of a year, our pro our project number, which was our third uh, project that we worked on on the year, our activity, and then our CSI line number. Our list of activities are the suggested ones that uh, we were given. Um, the quantity takeoff was done by Misael and Edgar. Um, we did add some additional light items that you'll see on the other slides, um, mostly directed to indirect costs. Uh, to start off our quantity takeoffs, Edgar and I divided half of the blank uh, activities in half. So I took on the first 11 and he took on the next 11. To start with footings, I use Bluebeam as a, my software package to find my areas for my contact area using the area measurement tool and dynamic fill, which made things a lot easier. Um, I use the area measurement tool to find things like my contact area, cubic yards, um, and other quantities for drywall and ceilings by using the wall area uh, by just applying the dimension of the wall for the side walls at eight foot seven. So that gave me a drywall for walls, for example, seven, about 7,000 square foot and drywall for ceilings at three, about 4,000 square foot. Uh, I also went through the plans and used uh, a count markup on Bluebeam uh, using the search tool to find those key, uh, the keys found in the general notes to find things like uh, the HVAC, electrical, and plumbing. Uh, some assumptions I made are for some of the footing schedules that were given were a 12 inch thick footing, uh, since some of the footing schedules didn't provide those uh, dimensions. Um, here you can see my markup for both electrical and the floor plan for things like the doors, uh, sinks, uh, electrical components, and window, um, the floor plan. Uh, other assumptions I made for, uh, for plumbing was for the pipe supply hot and cold at 380 linear feet and for pipe waste at 250 linear feet. So these assumptions were made uh, based on other 3,000 square foot houses um, with similar amount of sinks, bathtubs, and bathrooms. 
Um, something, another assumption I made was that the steel bearing plates for the structural steel columns to have uh, weren't structural elements. So I <clears throat> separated those from structural steel. So to, to complete the, the part of my takeoff, uh, I, I use plan swift. I uploaded the drawing to plan swift and I, and I use some different colors to differentiate the areas in the building. I also use different color to differentiate the perimeter, the perimeter length I mean, of the walls and some triangles and squares and circles to quantify the windows and cabinets and and vanity cabinets in the in, in the project. So for the total quantity of windows for the project, we, we calculate that we have 62 windows. And for the cabinets in the kitchen, we have 12. Cabinets, cabinets in the bathroom, eight. And cabinets in the laundry room, we have seven. So we also have a one fireplace that's in the living room. We have a multiple sinks of thousands in the area, which give us a total of 24. And we, like I said, we get this number and we give it to uh, Barun and Samora so that, that way they can upload it, everything to Eris means. So after, find, after finding our quantities of the suggested level, a, a list of activities, uh, we used the drawings from the documents provided and the quantities found from, from Misael and Edgar in order to find the best lines in RS means that best represents the, the activities. In this step, it was crucial to convert some units because on RS means they were different. Um, after we, we had a list on RS means of all the activities, uh, we exported it into an Excel sheet, uh, which then we we were able to find the, the duration by dividing the quantity by the daily output of each um, line item. And then after that, we added all the duration, durations of each line item from RS means to have a total duration, which is explained on the next slide. So for those three line items that we found on RS means, for example, for instance, they were from our kitchen there were cabinets from our kitchen or bathroom in the laundry room, but in order for it to work on Nevis work for 4D and 5D model, uh, we made a shorter list um, that was just uh, composed of, of less activities. So for instance, this, so for those three activities, it was just our cost, custom cabinets. And yeah. After that, we analyzed our crew formation. Uh, for this example, we used a structural steel member. Uh, we were able to see that our crew was um, E2. E2 is composed of different uh, people. Or we have a foreman, worker, operators, uh, for crane oilers, or crane. Um, you can see the hourly rate and your daily rate. Uh, moving to the next slide, we could see we had to consider our workers' compensation, our average fixed overhead, and their overhead, uh, which made up our labor uh, labor factor, uh, and that would give us our total wage, uh, which is increased increased from five thousand one hundred and six all the way to five thousand two hundred and eight, and that that's what we did for every RS means uh, line item. And then after that, we were um, continuing off uh, for phase two, we were able to find our uh, direct cost. Uh, RS means uh, does a great job on giving you the, the cost of material, labor and equipment, and then it sums up all the cost into one total cost.
So for our job logic relationship, we took our activities that Victor um, was able to combine, uh, as he explained previously with the RS mean line items. Uh, we then assigned the durations for those acti activities that were combined, as you can see for uh, footing, slab on grade 22 and 22 days. Uh, we then assigned the predecessors um, um, depending on the, the sequence that we thought was best for the schedule. Uh, we did this by uh, finding the best logic that would apply to this uh, single family home in order to get the project done as soon as possible and then the best way possible. Um, Barun will then talk about the schedule. So basically for scheduling purpose, the software which was used was Primavera P6. As, uh, as I got the data regarding the activity IDs and the activity name and the duration of the activities, the next, all these data were inputted into the Primavera P6 software. The start date of the project was taken as May 2nd. The finish date of the project was taken uh, was to be September 6th. And uh, the thing what we have taken is the relationship which we have taken from one activity to other activity is going to be start to finish. There is no other kind of relationship with, that we have used. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, in the next slide, we can see a photo of the Primavera schedule here. So the basic, basically, uh, basically, as I told you, the job logic which was used was finished to start. And here, what the working days is going to be five days in a week. And, and, the, and it's going to be the total duration of the project is going to be around, around 122 days before crashing or before uh, doing any other activities. This is the schedule what we got from CPM. So the major activities which are at the longer duration are going to be HVAC, electrical, plumbing, and the initial, st initial structural works and the installation of ceramic tiles. So this is a, a fighting model of the project. Uh, to do this model, I, I export the model from Revit and I also uh, I, I downloaded the, pro the, the Primavera schedule and the uh, cost from RS means, and I plot all this information to Navi's work. And this is the result of, of that information in it. If you see in the top left corner, you will see that, uh, is, that the project is changing for every task, for every week, and it's also increasing the cost of the project for every task too. So after Varun uh, was able to complete his schedule, it was it was up to me to take information that Richard and Victor came up with from the RS means cruise formation. So from the crew formations for each activity, I applied the crews required for each of those activities that we saw uh, were explained by Varun from the schedule. To do this, I took uh, in P6, I needed to create some of the new trades so I added new trades under the trades tab that you can see uh, to your right. Um, so we have trades like brick layer and brick layer helpers and carpenters. Uh, I also added the equipment such as the crane and the gas engine vibrator for footings and the mixing machine for the stucco. Uh, I then assigned a, the sources to each activity on P6. Uh, from the combined activities that we saw previously. I then use the usage profile tab to analyze our resources. What I noticed was that our resource demand was higher than what we had available. And this was an issue because if this was the case, our project would not be able to be constructed in a timely manner and in a costly manner. So this was an issue that we needed to fix by using resource leveling. Uh, the two examples you see here are the carpenters and tile layers. So on the top of your screen, you see the carpenters. Uh, you see the resource demand is higher in the red. And in the green, we see what we have available. Uh, same thing for the tile layers towards the end of the project uh, when we were installing ceramic tiles. Uh, for the first about eight days, we saw uh, resource demand that was higher than what we had available. 
So we had to accommodate for this by uh, applying resource leveling and allocation. Um, so after I applied the resource allocation, I mean the, yeah, and leveling, we, uh, we were able to see how the carpenters and all the other trades uh, resource demand became much more feasible uh, for the schedule that we had created. Uh, on top, you see again, the carpenter resource, resource after it was leveled uh, compared to what we saw in the previous slide. So our resource demand is now what we have available throughout the project. Uh, similar for the tile layers, we see a much, uh, much better resource demand and, and what is available. Uh, so after this was done, our schedule was pushed back about a month to October 6, uh, which we expected because we needed those resources to uh, finish those tasks on time um, and make the project feasible, even though we, uh, it was going to push the, the schedule back. So below, we also see our resource allocation table from P6. So this is automatically generated from what we inserted for the resource tabs. Uh, for example, for the labors, we see uh, the first week of May, May 2nd, we see uh, the eight resources that are needed. And then I'll, it also applies it to the other activities. So it reaches our resource demand and what we have available and if those resources will be available for that day or if you have to push activities back. So this is all seen after the resource leveling has been finished uh, for this phase of the project. For the time cost trade-off analysis, uh, we first began by locating our two items on the critical path uh, that we deemed appropriate to do uh, a crash cost and duration. Uh, the two activities were the backfill and the ceramic tile. Um, the backfill was included with the footings. Um, so on the following slides, you'll see that the footings got crashed. Um, the original crew formation for the backfill was one common labor and for the ceramic tile was one tile layer. Uh, the production for, for one common labor is 20.6. Uh, while the quantity is 423, making the duration 20.6. And following the same concept, we get the ceramic tile duration for 27.1. Uh, with the crash cost, uh, we get the new duration for the backfill to 5.1 and the new ceramic tile duration to 6.8. Um, we rounded that up to six and seven. Um, we do get a reduction to the overall cost of the project to 25,000. Originally, our overhead was at 12%. Um, with this drop, we have our overhead at 8%, and you'll see that on the following slides as well. Um, we did add more resources uh, to make this crash possible. Uh, we added four times for, uh, uh, four times for each, acti each activity, um, and this just added more resources um, for sitting alone construction when deemed it appropriate. I just saved the 25,000 and we grabbed additional resources from other projects just to complete this. Yeah, it also brought our school back down uh, about a month to for a finish date of August 10th, around, around August 10th as well. And then continuing on to the indirect costs. Um, so, these are just some of the line items that we had, uh, which were the cleaning of the job site, tempering fences, just to make ensure that the job site is safe, clean. We also added storage boxes. Um, different trades are gonna need to store uh, material at different times, especially for the condition that we have in Colorado. We also had temporary electrical. Uh, we had a field engineer come out to do our survey markings. Um, and as well, we did ha have to rent a forklift out um, just for the tr for certain trades. And we deemed it appropriate just to have that on site for multiple trades instead of having the, the trade itself, uh, to have the subcontract itself get that for themselves. And then we also did a lot of aggregate testing for our concrete pours. And these are just some of our line items. Uh, so continuing uh, phase four uh, was our ca cash flow. Uh, the cash flow was used to 
to show how much money had to be paid by the client every month in order to keep the project going. Um, if we continue to the next slide, we're able to see the different percentages um, that we have to consider. Uh, so we have to consider 8% um, in indirect cost, 5% in our profit, and then 10% on our, um, our retainage ratio. Um, as you can see on the graph, uh, you have three different lines. The red line represents your outflow, uh, which, which is uh, how much money we spent every month um, as the general contractor. The blue line represents your, our income, which is the money that we have received from our client. And then the yellow line represents our overdraft, which is simply the difference between the outflow and the income. And as you can see, it turns positive as we get it um, towards the end. Um, because that's the, the retainage money that we that we receive from our client. So as the project moves along and we start to see different phases, uh, we expect to see our planned budget and our actual budget change. Um, for this, we built a control chart in phase five. So on the left-hand side, you see an empty control chart that would be uh, filled out as we start the, from the start of the project all the way to the end. Uh, as an example, I wanted to go ahead and uh, project three quarters of the way through the project. So you here you see the total budget for each activity, footings down to finishes, our planned progress, uh, what we expect to see up to that third quarter of the project, our planned value, um, our actual cost, what we ex also expect. Uh, for actual cost, we also assume that our total budget would be the same, or, or at least very similar uh, from our estimating and our estimating team. Uh, from our progress is also uh, listed. So this is what is expected to see uh, in that third quarter of the project and moving on to things like um, interior finishes, carpets and uh, custom car uh, cabinets. Uh, we also have the cost variance, which would be the difference between our earned value and our actual cost. Our schedule variance, which would show the difference in our schedule, our CPI or SPI and our FAC as well. So if you look at uh, our chart, our table on the right, you can see down for the entire project, our total budget of $419,000. Uh, for that um, uh, up to the end of that project. So up to 75% completion, we would see a lot of those budgets consumed and already paid. So we would be on track uh, with both our plan progress and our plan budget by that third quarter as well. So for the procurement chart, I use the schedule. So what I did is I review every activity of the schedule and, and I assign when do I need to have the material on site. So for example, if, if the we're pouring, we're pouring in Monday, well, at least we need to have, you know, two, one week, two weeks for the, for the lumber and equipment. And I also assign what day we need to have a pump and, and the concrete and the quantity for concrete on site. And I also did a little study in there for, you know, with other, with asking to all, to suppliers and we determined, we didn't study which supplier is closer to the site, who is the supplier more knowledgeable and also the cost. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Varun Janiwara Balakrishna Gauda. And for this course project, Victor. using Procore as my tablet application. Right now, what you're seeing in the screen is going to be the cover page of Procore. And this access, the projects, what you're seeing is the projects which I'm working in my, uh, is, is the project which I'm using for my work. So moving on to the one of those projects, let's see the different tools what we can use in Procore. First tool, what I'm going to explain with you is going to be regarding the RFI. As we know, RFI is the request for proposal. And we can see here that this is the RFI log, which is going to be generated in Procore as soon as we put in the RFIs. 
So the main thing what we can see is the number of the RFI, the subject of the RFI, the status of the RFI, whether it's open or closed, the responsible contractor, and whom did I receive it from, the date of in the date which is initiated, and the RFI manager for this current RFI. Assignees, assignees are the person who are going to be approving the RFIs or who are going to be answering the RFIs. So they are going to be technically the architects and the engineers. And the ball in code refers to as when when I send when I send the RFI into the for approval or RFI in for answers. That's that then the ball in code is going to be the ball in code of the engineers. And once they return it with the reply for the RFI, then the ball in code is going to be the ball in code of the manager or the RFI manager. So this is how the RFI log looks. So creating an RFI is also very easy using Pro Code, where basic details have to be put in, and the RFI is going to be generated. Basic details such as the number of the RFI, the subject relating to the RFI, the assignees to whom this is the RFI is going to be assigned to, or the approvers for the RFI, uh, and these things have to be added. Distribution list is the list of people who are going to be involved with this RFI, such as if uh, if an RFI is sent from a plumbing subcontractor, then all the people on the project manager, the superintendent from the plumbing subcontractor, then the people working with the general contractor must be in loop regarding this RFI, and these are the people who are going to be on the distribution list. The third one is going to be the received from, and who is going to receive this RFI from, and other details regarding the drawing number specifications. Once everything is populated, we can create this and create this RFI and let it as open. So moving on to the next features, creating submittals. So the how to create submittals. Submittals are the approvals for the product which we are going to be using on our project. Same like the RFI log, you are going to get the submittal log with all the different informations. And creating a new submittal in Procore is really easy, where we have to create a new submittal. So we can see we can add the title in the specifications of the submittals the number of the submittal and the revision, the responsible contractor for it, submit by that is the maximum time what we are going to give to the engineers or the architects to, uh, to get an answer on this submittal. And the lead time, the cost codes are the other things which are going to be entered. And uh, these and the cost codes are the other things which are going to be entered. For the final due date for the submittal has, has also to be entered. The content has to be attached with the cover letter here. And once it is done, we need to create. We need to create and send emails so that the submittal is created and it is sent to the respective people or the respective engineers. Moving on, the next thing which I want to show in Procore was regarding punch lists, uh, punch lists, and the other things which I wanted to show was the drawings. So moving on to the drawings, finding drawings from Procore is way more easier than finding uh, drawings from the A1 sheet bundles what we see in olden days. So basically you have a search toolbar here and if we can search the drawings which is required and we can get it at, at an instance of time. And other than that, all the drawings are segregated based on their different categories, whether they are the general drawings, they are the architectural drawings, or they are gonna be, they are gonna be the civil drawings. So each of the drawings are going to be segregated and bifurcated so that it is going to be easy for us to search in and access the drawings. The next thing what we are going to be seeing here is going to be the specifications. So basically specifications are going to be arranged according to the CSI format. And uh, specifications are going to be arranged according to the CSI format. As we can see, section 00 is going to be procurement and control, section 1, the general requirements, and all the specifications regarding general requirements are put in. In the same way, section three, section four, section five is gonna be concrete masonry and metals. So all the specifications are divided according to the CSI format and finding the specifications is gonna be easy. And we can also use the search. We can also use the search menu to get into the specifications very fast. So the next thing what we are gonna be seeing is gonna be the, uh, is gonna be the photos. So while looking at the photos, these are the photos which are going to be taken. So they are, they are going to be different folders which can put. These are the photos from the architects regarding the elevation of the drawings. These are the aerial photos which are or the drone photos which we take on a weekly basis. And these are the photos from our daily log. So these photos are going to be stored in, in, in order of their days. 
So these are all the photos which are taken on site in the month of May. And these are all the photos which are taken on site in the month of April. So this is how we can add photos. The next thing which I wanted to go on was, rega was regarding the other functions or the other tools which are gonna be handy. These tools which, are, which I've explained are gonna be helping us with a lot of things and these major tools which are going to be using on an everyday basis as a project engineer that is going to be the RFIs, submittals, the, the incidents and the photos, drawings, specifications. Moving on, moving on to the moving on to the schedules, the schedule relating to the project can also be uploaded, can also be uploaded in pro code and the directory directory. Let's see what's directory is. Directory is a place where we can find information regarding the different people working under different subcontractors on our project. Uh, so let's we they can we can also share documents and be on the same place with the help of Proco. So these are all the important tools which can be used in Proco and Proco is going to be a very useful app because it is very easy to use and it's a user friendly app and sharing documents and sharing pictures or anything related to the project is going to be very easy on Procore and it can be made sure that all the people related to the project are on the same platform and they are not missing any of those documents. So this is, this is the demonstration of Procore and this is our tablet application.